Well, welcome again, everybody. Uh, it's very nice to see so many of you back. It's nice to see some new faces. Uh, I would like to begin, as ever, with my very brief thanks. There were more fulsome expressions of that at the very beginning of the lecture series, but again to the Bodleian Libraries for hosting us. We're very grateful to their staff for shepherding us in and looking after the building, for the Torch team, to whom I'm grateful on a daily basis for helping to make things happen, and for Princeton University Press for suggesting our collaboration. Most of all, though, thanks to Martin, who's now been here for so long, I think we can officially declare him not just in Oxford, but of Oxford, uh, <laughs> if he would like to be, of course. So uh, thank you so much. Um, we will hear the lecture. There'll be time for questions at the end. One of the most exciting things about this lecture series has not just been the quality of the word delivered. I was going to say ex-cathedra, but it's, we're talking up rather than, than down here. But actually, the, the continued strong presence and attendance, the vitality of the questions and the intellectual engagement we've had from the wider university community. So thank you, too, as well, for coming out and making this part of what is a very exciting conversation for us here in Oxford Humanities at the moment. This is about more than Oxford. We had global, we've had the world, we've had history. We now have the future. Um, we've had everything in this series. So, Martin, we look forward very much to hearing what you have to say on this third and final of the Torch Princeton University Press lectures. Martin Buchner, please. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. Uh, it's great to be back. Um, and because I see so many familiar faces, and thank you for coming back for a Third helping, I will cap up, uh, recap only ever so briefly, uh, reminding everyone that I started last week um, with a history of the idea of world literature as it was born from a very particular, strange conversation between Goethe and his secretary after Goethe had read a Chinese novel. I then followed this idea to various moments in its biography from uh, London to, to India and uh, Melek Ravitch, the propo uh, proponent of uh, Yiddish world literature, looking at how different people had used, had deployed this term world literature for different purposes. In the second lecture, I uh, talked about different institutions of world literature, uh, briefly touching on such institutions as UNESCO, um, think tanks, uh, U.S. service academies, literary prizes, uh, and, and the like, but then really honing in on one particular institution that I know well from the inside, namely the one of these big Norton anthologies, uh, in this case, the Norton Anthology of World Literature, thinking about canon formation and making along the way an argument about a scale, uh, uh, asking literary critics to get comfortable with large, if not grand, narratives and scale. Today, um, I want to try out a different argument that might, be, uh, might fall under the rubric of applied literature and applied humanities. And as I mentioned briefly, I think on last week, um, I recently tried out this for me very new idea in a department meeting, uh, the Department of English at Harvard University, and it earned howls of protest. So, so if you feel the need to howl, please uh, do so. I will nevertheless uh, persist and uh, try to make this argument as persuasively as I can. The idea of applied uh, literature, applied literary criticism is simply that I think in literary history we have a lot of useful knowledge and that we aren't always good in, in promoting that useful knowledge in conversation with other disciplines. This, I think, uh, pre uh, observation uh, has, for me, arisen out of conversations in, with people in different professional schools at Harvard, especially the business school, School of Engineering, and the medical school, where people in these very applied professional schools feel like they need narrative resources for various purposes, whether that is to think about patient stories in narrative medicine, which is, of course, now a thriving field, to uh, pitching companies and the kinds of stories that are necessary there, to, of course, we all know that in politics, politicians with the best stories win, yet where are literary critics in these conversations? So this is sort of the broader landscape. I will make a particular argument um, about 
climate uh, change and climate science based on the observation and conversations with climate scientists at different institutions that they have come to the realization that for the past 40 years, the main objective of climate science has been to come up with better science, to increase the probability and predictions to, you know, let's say, from 80% to 95%. And I think they have realized that that was, in some sense, a, a, the wrong or a too limited a trajectory that in order to turn climate science into a broader frames of understanding and perhaps even action, um, we need better stories. And so they have come to literary critics, in this case, to me, and I found it surprisingly perhaps difficult to, to respond to that call and to think about how literary studies um, can, um, can, can contribute uh, to, to this. So what, what I'm going to do today is to think about some, to, to, to report a little bit on some very new and, and very much work in progress little projects uh, and thoughts that have come out of that conversation, out of my attempt to respond to this call to apply li literature and literary criticism to this particular problem of climate change. Now, in some sense, literature and literary criticism is, I think, extremely well positioned to, to play a role, in part because climate change is, among many other things, a real problem of representation, both because it's such a uh, some call it a hyper object. It's impossible to hold in your mind because it's so complex and extensive and extensive, both in terms of time and place. It can also be a real a challenge because of the slowness of change. And there's particularly one literary critic, um, um, Rob Nixon, um, who thinks has thought a lot about the way literature can bring this very difficult to grasp and very difficult to perceive question of slow violence uh, into bringing that into visibility. This book, uh, I think, falls under the rubric of literary criticism, environmental or eco-criticism, that is about the degradation of the natural world, harks back to one of the classics, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. There are, of course, many other ways in which literature ha can play a role. Of course, the prehistory of this particular 20th century brand of eco-criticism in the 18th and 19th century, having to do with romanticism, nature, writing, uh, for example. Another example would be this, the whole debate about the post-human, which obviously relates to the way in which humans have to live in relation to non human environments. I won't talk about this very much today. I just want to mention it in passing. And then the probably overwhelming story type that a lot of writing on the environment and the environmental crisis involves, and that's the dystopian and apocalyptic narrative and scenarios that we know so well. And Margaret Atwood perhaps is the most well-known representative uh, here. So what can um, world literature, as I've tried to set it up in the last two uh, days, last two lectures, um, contribute here? For, for the first, uh, uh, first argument, we'll have to do with the canon, the standard literary canon that is mobilized in relation to the climate crisis is a relatively recent canon. Uh, it's maybe 100, 200 years old. And it is not necessarily a canon that has much to do with the canon of world literature. Here, I want to refer to another wonderful eco-critic, Ursula Heisen, um, who says in another book than this, observes that most of the texts that eco-critics have studied have emerged from national traditions of nature writing and are in many ways disconnected from the canon of world literature. So this is going to be my first attempt to think about what can world literature contribute here 
it is to think about the relation between the canon of nature writing or the kinds of texts that eco-critics tend to focus on in relation to the larger canon of world literature. Because I think this canon can be a powerful resource offering a broader range of texts that eco-critics can uh, engage with. And because I've already mentioned a couple of times uh, one such text, in, in some, men, some sense, the earliest text, uh, the, the first masterwork of world literature, I want to spend a moment with the epic of Gilgamesh. I mentioned it last time as one of the earliest texts uh, in world literature, one of the anchors and of, of earliest long texts and anthologies of world literature. And it, when read through the lens of eco-criticism, there are at least two paradigms, two ways of thinking about uh, literature in relation to the natural world that think I think are laid down in this very first masterwork of world literature. The first one, and the, in some sense, most obvious one, is the story of the flood. This is the flood tablet. Um, and it presents uh, the you know, climate change, if you will, as a kind of retribution or punishment in a kind of moral theological register um, that is so visible. And it begins with the first masterwork of world literature and runs all the way to Margaret Atwood. Uh, it's, of course, a story that then gets recycled in the Hebrew Bible and thereby sort of enters the bloodstream of world literature and I think is one of the deep stories about the natural world that writers and maybe critics keep defaulting to. And I think it's good to recognize that and think about that. But the story of the flood is perhaps even, you know, is the most obvious, but it's maybe not even the most interesting aspect of the Epic of Gilgamesh because it's just an interpolated tale uh, 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 told by Utna Tish, Tish, Tish pished him, um, the Noah figure, uh, uh, towards the end. The core story uh, uh, in the epic of Gilgamesh is even more interesting. It involves King Gilgamesh and his sidekick, and Kidu, who go on many adventures. Uh, perhaps some of you have read this wonderful epic, um, including the sort of most central adventure is when they go and slay the monster Humbaba. So this is a great story. It's also a story of hubris because the, story, the monster turns out to have been protected by a god and all kinds of problems follow from that interaction. But uh, I don't want to think so much about this as a slaying the monster story, but where they go and why they go because they go from the city of Uruk in today's Iraq to Lebanon. And they slay the monster, but they also bring back timber. And that brings me to the fact that the Epic of Gilgamesh, as I may have mentioned briefly last time, is a story, the first story of world literature that celebrates urbanism. The city of Uruk, where the story is set, uh, the, ci the city that it celebrates is one of the first uh, urban spaces in world history. And it gets highlighted by the Epic. The Epic of Gilgamesh starts by giving its readers really a tour of the city. It's a city made of clay. King Gilgamesh is seen as the king that has rebuilt the city wall around uh, Uruk. It, 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 it shows off the city as a kind of miracle made out of clay, as I said, one of the first urban spaces. Um, it even gives us a tour of the clay pits from which the material uh, 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 out of which the city is made are harvested. And of course, the most important use of clay is this one that I talked about last time, namely that is the surface for cuneiform writing. Okay, but in order to build cities, you don't only need clay, you also need timber, which means that as urbanism takes off in Mesopotamia, deforestation. People have to go further and further to get timber for cities and to rebuild cities like Uruk, which is the lived experience that stands behind this uh, adventure uh, when uh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu go off to Lebanon 
to get timber and bring it back to the city of Uruk. So we have here a really interesting, for me, confluence of urbanism, uh, environmental degradation, resource extraction, and literature that presents itself as the great celebration, in a way, or the pinnacle of urban civilization. And interesting, the Epic of Gilgamesh is an epic that really celebrates writing, because it, it presents Gilgamesh as a writer king, which is very different, for example, from the Homeric epics, which, as you may know, present themselves as being sung orally. And they present a world, even though they're much later, that, that it's with one strange exception, a world entirely without writing, even when they're written down. The world in which that's uh, uh, the, 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 uh, depicted in the Homeric epics is without writing. Uh, not so the earlier Gil uh, epic of Gilgamesh, which presents itself as being written uh, and, and presents uh, King Gilgamesh as a writer king. So an interesting um, confluence here. On the one hand, um, the origin of the story of the flood and its retribution laying down one a paradigm for climate change and this a story that if you read it just a little bit against the grain uh, or not even against the grain between the lines is a story about environmental degradation, resource extraction, and the fact that literature at its origin on for most of the next three, three and a half thousand years is basically coextensive with that urban living um, that, that leads to envi environmental de degradation. So I think a fascinating story right there at the very beginning of the history of world literature to think about climate change. And it's interesting that not many eco-critics do that. There are a few uh, um, exceptions. There's one American writer, Roy Scranton, who had a really uh, influential essay in the New York Times, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene, turned that into a little booklet. And he mentions uh, briefly um, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Why? Because he is um, an Iraq war vet veteran uh, and found himself, of course, in Iraq. And as someone interested in culture, he started to think about the history uh, of, of literature in Iraq. Uh, in, and of course, then came to the epic of, uh, of Gilgamesh, but I think an exception rather than the rule of um, environmental writing. So there, there, I think there are lots of interesting implications here from, from the story. Um, and I think one can think about the relation between the story of the flood and this uh, fact that literature here <coughs> registers, even though it doesn't criticize, Res the re kind of resource extraction that, that begins with urban living um, and the way in which literature is, as an institution, um, is really implicated in that. I think it bears, it, it, it highlights for me one interesting aspect of, of, of a difference between world literature um, and the kind of the environmental canon, because most of the texts written by the env environmental canon, I think, are written from an idea of literature that places the writer in a very sort of modern sense at, at a remove and at a distance from power. Uh, the writer who criticizes the system uh, or powerful institutions, in the, in the case of Rachel Carson, uh, chemi big chemical corporations or oil corporations or states. Uh, uh, so very much the kind of the myth of the modern writer as a kind of dissident, as a lonely voice, as someone who is, uh, is unconnected in some sense to, to power. The world literature view on literature is more what I see at work in Gilgamesh, namely where you can see that for almost the entirety of, of those 4,000 years of literature, writing and the state uh, and urbanism were basically coextensive. So th this isn't to say that this sort of dissident writer figure that we tend to favor and that's so central to the environmental canon doesn't exist or is, is not important, but it's more saying that it's a sort of an, an interesting exception, I would say, to the way writing has functioned for most of its history and that we can think about 
that. So then, of course, the story of the flood, as I mentioned, and as you know, gets recycled in the Hebrew Bible. It's, it's charged even more theologically and, and, and morally. And it gets a, another sidekick, maybe, namely the apocalypse. Now, uh, in, in, in contrast to the current use of the term apocalypse, the apocalypse, of course, is not a story of retribution. It's more an idea of a, a kind of violent revelation of truth uh, uh, at the end of time, an unmasking of things uh, rather than a punishment for, for moral failings. Um, however, in the subsequent reception, this, this reading of the apocalypse, this sort of theological reading of the apocalypse, I think gets more and more sort of merged with the moral morality of the story of, of the flood and the two of them uh, form a kind of pair or sort of uh, uh, superimposed upon each other and, and lay down a lot of the, uh, uh, the story types, I think, that we are dealing with in environmental literature. So I think there are a couple of possible implications to this observation. The first is that I th we can expand the, the range of texts that come into a purview of, 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 of eco-criticism. Um, and I've been even thinking about, uh, since I have at my disposal, with all the constraints imposed on it that I discussed last time, this large anthology that, that's used very widely in the US, um, the Norton Anthology of World Literature. <laughs> and so I've been starting to think about how I can use that at, to highlight moments like the one I just mentioned with the uh, story of the flood, Epic of Gilgamesh, the Hebrew Bible, and to, to, in a way, mobilize this particular resource and institution of world literature for this uh, uh, application of literature to the environmental crisis. And this can involve, in some cases, doesn't even involve, have to involve new kinds of selections because in a way, all these selections, all these texts are there. It's more about reframing them uh, in different ways and maybe have to figure out how to give teachers of these kinds of courses pointers. Uh, and I think that would be a powerful tool because as I mentioned last time, most of our adopters or half of our adopters are in the American South very conservative kind of places where most colleges and certainly high schools don't really teach uh, very much about environmental change. So I'm thinking about sort of using world literature courses as a kind of Trojan horse, uh, to use a world literature metaphor, to, to, um, to put that in there. I haven't quite figured out how to do that. So this is a first uh, uh, idea, first proposal, having to do with canon and the two different canons, the environmental canon and the canon of world literature. The, the second uh, uh, initiative I want to report on is a, is a collaboration that's also just starting with a sort of think tank science research institute outside Vienna in a very fancy castle, uh, Yasa, uh, with this complicated name, uh, Institute for Applied Systems Analysis, Applied. Um, this is a, 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 a sort of think tank mostly devoted to these broad, urgent topics that sort of span many different disciplines and branches of science, such as the fourth industrial revolution or, or climate change. And the way I got hooked up uh, with, with these people is actually through a former student of mine, Gloria Benedict, who was trained and was a professional dancer, then went back to university, did a degree, and somehow talked her way, very impressive way, talked her way into the Science Institute as the resident artist. Um, so, and so she and I in this institute have been trying to think about how literature can contribute. So besides rethinking the sort of deep canon of literature that can be read and, and mobilized, the people at Yasa and, and Gloria Benedict have mostly been saying, okay, so we, ha we, de we keep defaulting to stories like the flood, the apocalypse, these moralistic tales, and these cat catastrophic tales. They don't seem to be working very well. What other stories are out there? So we've started to compile different 
basically out of narratology, different ways of classifying story types. Um, and so there are, of course, a million ways of doing it. The most, some, one of the most amusing one is uh, by Kurt Vonnegut. And if you haven't done so, you can you go on YouTube and he explains these story types in a, in a very droll and deadpan American way. So he classifies them basically in a couple of types. There's the Cinderella story, which is described as rise and fall and rise again. There's a story type, boy gets girl. Of course, you could also say girl gets boy, boy gets boy. We can expand that. This is Kurt Vonnegut. Um, <laughs> Um, the third is man in a hole. We can also you know, add different kinds of people. Gets out. OK, so this is one way of classifying stories. But that it's, you know, it, 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 it works and it works, doesn't work. There are, um, there are other ways of doing it. Um, you can, especially if you start, look more in the deep history of literature, the Kurt Vonnegut is a little more about, yes, fairy tales, but a lot of contemporary literature is in a more kind of anthropological sense, there are the stories of rebirth, um, journeys, and return, the Odyssey, the Hobbit. You can all think of them. We have overcoming the monster, which is the Gilgamesh epic, uh, works really well. We have reach, ri riches to rags and rags to riches. Um, we have... Um, 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 the genie out of the bottle. This is, comes from the uh, Thousand and One Nights, another incredibly rich stor uh, resource for storytelling. Um, we have um, Fool Triumphant with a lot of applications to the political landscape right now. Um, we have stories of revenge. Uh, metamorphosis, very interesting for environmental criticism because it often, starting with Ovid, includes transformations of humans into non-human uh, uh, forms. Um, wretched access, stories of wretched access, also, of course, particularly applicable to environmental literature. Um, and um, we have conflict with God at the center of the epic of Gilgamesh from the very beginning, stories of revolt, and in modernism, uh, stories of madness. So we kept compiling more and more ways of classifying stories into three, into seven, into 35. Vladimir Prop, of course, did his fu wonderful functional analysis, uh, uh, dissecting fairy tales into many, many component parts. Um, we sort of ran uh, at a wall here and didn't quite know how to deal with it. At some point, we even despaired and said, OK, this is getting too much. Uh, we have to go back to. Joseph Campbell and said, there's only one story, uh, one hero, hero with a thousand faces. But the real point here, and we haven't quite figured out how to do this, if you, if you have good ideas, please let me know, is that I think what we need to do is somehow turn these various schemes, these various ways of creating narratological uh, 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 ways of classifying stories and turn them into toolboxes. Because that's what people at Yasa and these other in these other conversations want. They want they 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 don't want to default to apocalyptic flood stories, um, but they don't quite they don't try quite have the storytelling tools for coming up with alternatives. And so and this means both for them their scientists, also their communications departments and other people in that, in that world. So I think, I think this is something that uh, we, uh, if you put our minds to it, uh, can contribute here. Different types of stories that can, be, can get used in different ways. Um, so the, the other approach uh, we, we've taken is to think about stories that are informed by science. And here I want to report on something. I wasn't really involved in that. Uh, a collaboration this former student of mine, Gloria Benedict, did with a Harvard uh, evolutionary biologist, uh, uh, Martin Novak, who works on cooperation and reciprocity, especially what he calls indirect reciprocity, like A helps B, B helps C, and wants to put that at the center of uh, 
the evolutionary process. And he believes, he's a very confident person and very persuasive, that he can actually create a mathematical uh, formulation of this process of uh, uh, reciprocity. Uh, um, and he thinks that this changes the story of evolution, which is very easily translated into something like egotism, right? If you think about evolutionary uh, survival. And, and I don't want to talk too much about Darwin because we have here in the audience Kristen Shepard Barr, who knows so much about Darwin and the way his science-based story <coughs> has been used and abused and, and recycled in various ways. What Mark Novak uh, has done is really intervene right at the center of it, bring he's an evolutionary mathematician, bring mathematics to this and through a kind of game theory approach show that this story of egotism and survival is, is really one-sided and, and that instead uh, he, he, he came up with these various forms of reciprocity. The problem is that, as I said, it's basically a mathematical model that's very hard to understand. I certainly don't understand it. And this is where Gloria Benedict entered uh, 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 the scene and said, okay, what we need to do is we need to translate these papers that you, you Martin Novak, have published. And, and this is what she did, and I'm just gonna let this uh, play in the background with voice off. But as you can glean from these images, basically what they together have come up with a really cool uh, evening program that uh, exists in part of um, dance, and this is partially from the performance, partially from rehearsals, of l small lectures by Gloria Benedict, by Martin Novak, by others, um, interspersed with dance uh, interludes um, that translate different forms of reciprocity into wonderful dances, Gloria, um, and then also incorporate games uh, uh, played with the audience where, where the audience can respond to various scenarios, discuss various scenarios uh, uh, having to do with climate change. It was really terrific uh, work uh, that brings, in this case, not so much literary st storytelling, but performance uh, art uh, uh, and performance, uh, uh, this Martin Novak, uh, into into this world and, and as I said, translates, a, I think, really crucial but very difficult for non-mathematicians to understand point about reciprocity and evolution into, into this form that involves the audience, conveys messages. Well, it was uh, premiered at my little theater program at Harvard, but then went on to the UN where it was really well received and it was, it's really terrific. So this is another way of thinking about that really, and this is what Gloria's job at this think tank is primarily, is to turn papers, the most important papers that kind of come out of this institution into performances and to some extent also into stories. So one of the um, things that we started to think about more fully um, have been not just story types um, and different ways of translating actual science papers into stories, but to think in particular about protag <coughs> protagonists. Um, um, in the Q&A of the first lecture last week, someone pointed out, in some ways, in a very friendly way, accused me of always personalizing stories. Personalizing, for example, the birth of world literature out of a particular uh, conversation between Goethe and Ackermann. And so uh, uh, this comment really stayed, stayed with me and I have thought more about it. And it's, it's something that I think feeds into this conversation where we've thought about different kinds of protagonists. What are the how should we think about protagonists when it comes to n narratives contribution or storytelling contribution to climate change? Because clearly, this shouldn't just be about the single protagonist. Um, and here, one way of describing this, um, I guess I sorry, 
Oh yeah, okay, here. Um, is of course Greta Thunberg, whom I adore and love and consider as a kind of Jeanne d'Arc if I look at her through the arc, through the eyes of world literature. But I notice a very interesting paradox about agency. Because I think a lot, I hear a lot of people my age and older basically saying, Greta Thunberg and her generation, they are so great. We screwed up but they are gonna save us. They really understand about climate change. They are gonna change things. They are gonna make things right. Basically putting agency to people like Greta Thunberg and her generation, which is in a way perverse because what Greta Thunberg is saying is exactly the opposite. She's saying, you need to act. I'm helpless. We can't fix this. We are just kids. You you are the agent of the story. So there's, I think, a, a big uh, debate about agency and, and the agent uh, uh, who, who is the agent, which is, brings us back to a kind of literary and narrative uh, a challenge. And so when I thought about collective agents and how literature over time has dealt with that, there are way, various ways of, of dealing with this, but my default is the communist manifesto because it is a text that in some way, and I've mentioned this in passing first lecture, uh, um, is a text whose main goal was in some sense to construct for the first time a collective agent called the proletariat that didn't really exist before. Yes, there were exploited workers before, but the, 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 the purpose, the literary challenge, if you will, of the Communist Manifesto is to say, no, there is an agent in history, a new agent. Uh, I, the, com the Communist Manifesto, are, am conjuring this agent into existence in, or at least into self-consciousness, uh, and that is the the, the proletariat. So th this seems to be an interesting model. I, I mentioned in passing that it's also interesting to me that, that it is this text that tries out to introduce a new agent, collective agent into history, that, that is a text that is also at the same time so interested in world literature. I read the paragraph uh, the first day, the, the interesting paragraph where Marx and Engels think about, in some sense, celebrate world literature for having done away with national one-sidedness and narrow-mindedness. And I think this is something that the Communist Manifesto doesn't just preach, it also practices it, because there is the preamble, the preamble ends of the manifesto, the famous preamble, ends with this sentence that uh, communists of various nations have assembled in London and sketched the following manifesto to be published in the English, French, German, Italian, Flemish, and Dan Danish languages. No mention here that German is actually the original language of, of the manifesto, and at this <laughs> very moment, the only language of the manifesto. And it, so there is a kind of aspirational quality here, I would say an aspiration towards world literature, an aspiration that actually remains an aspiration for quite some time. Because as you can see, the manifesto felt really flat uh, when it was published uh, in, in February of 48. It, there was almost no resonance and it was basically forgotten. It takes a couple of decades for attempted editions in different languages to appear, a first peak is around the French Commune, and then a second, of course, around the uh, 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 Russian Revolution. And then it actually starts to fulfill this kind of aspiration of world literature. It's also world literature in a second sense because there is often an interesting disconnect between the language uh, of translation and the place of publication. Of course, the first uh, uh, edition, editions in German in London, and even though Marx and Engels talk about a very an international group of people that have an assembled, in in actuality it was mostly German artisans, a very small obscure group of German artisans who have uh, who assembled there. Um, there is a first uh, English translation, 1950 which uh, translates the wonderful first sentence with the infamous, infamous English, a frightful hobgoblin stalks Europe 
the hobgoblin of communism, uh, um, to be then replaced a few years later with the now famous uh, translation. But that continues. You see the first Russian translation done in Geneva. Uh, and, and this con continues. And this is in part a response to uh, censorship. You can see here various places and languages of publication because of censorship, because of sort of underground networks uh, under which these communists uh, um, operated. So it becomes world literature in that sense as well. So we are thinking, well, what can we learn from the Communist Manifesto? It managed, after some delay, to become world literature and to conjure into existence this collective protagonist. But it's, very, it's been very interesting to me since I have a long-standing interest in, in, in manifest, not just the Communist Manifesto, but all manifestos that the social movements of our day um, from Occupy Wall Street to Black Lives Matter to environmental activism have shied away from the manifesto. And I think this has to do with the collective we of this particular form. So Marx and Engels, they co-write this manifesto, but they don't write it under their own names, so to speak. They are commissioned to write this manifesto for this little group of underground artisans. So they, they lend their voice, uh, but it is essentially a collective voice that speaks through it. And I think at this cultural moment, we have real problems with that. Um, the idea that someone can speak for someone else, that there is a we that can emerge. I feel this, especially perhaps in, in the US, that where there is a lot of worries about speaking for someone, uh, subsuming differences under a collective we. And so it's been very interesting to see that, for example, in the context of Occupy Wall Street, people were sort of edging closer to feeling, oh, really what we really need to articulate our goals is a manifesto, but they could never quite bring themselves to do it. And I think the same is true with other movement, movements. So I think you know, sometimes I find myself bemoaning that, but at the same time, I think that's probably futile. We have to take that seriously as one of the intellectual conditions of, of our time. So this led me to think about not just um, um, collective protagonists, but who actually writes stories. Because if there's any lessons to be learned from this unwillingness of our social movements to write manifesto and to produce that collective we to speak for someone else, uh, to tell someone else's story or tell collective stories, it means that it can't be a matter of somehow finding the right people to author, author another story. There has to be some form, some act of collective storytelling that has to happen. And here too, I think world literature has interesting models for that. For me, it's the great genre of roughly the Middle Ages. It's one of the patterns that emerged for me by looking at the, uh, at, at the anthology work we did, um, namely that roughly in the Middle Ages, you have an unbelievable rise of these frame tale narratives from India to Greece. The most well-known, of course, is The Thousand and One Nights with its frame tale, but equally interesting, the Panchatantra uh, uh, from India. And one of the interesting things is that these stories, individual stories, circulate through these variously framed story collections. But there's always a frame around a kind of act of collective storytelling. Interestingly, they're also often framed as educational, often as uh, story collections aimed at educating princes, even in the Thousand and One Nights. This is particularly explicit in the Panchatantra, uh, but even the Thousand and One Nights, the frame tale of Shah Asad, her sister, and the king. It's clear the king has been driven mad by his wife's infidelities. Um, and Sher Assad not only has to survive each night by you know, working with cliffhangers, but she also has to educate, re-educate the king back into sanity, um, which she accomplishes by the end. So we started to think about these frame tale narratives, and it occurred to us that, yes, in a sense, this is 
where we are right now. Because clearly we are uh, in a moment of literary production that I think is moving out of the Gutenberg world. And that means out of a world in which literature is produced by individual authors who's, who, who own Origin, who invent original stories, who own copyright on these stories and sell these stories on a kind of global marketplace. Instead, we are back, in a sense, to an older form of producing literature that's closer to these frame tail narratives, where it's about aggregating, uh, collecting stories, aggregating them, editing them, picking and choosing, framing, and reframing. Right? We have different words for it, um, like aggregating, like curating, um, all the stuff that happens on social media and elsewhere. And I think for me, it, it seems sort of shocking and to some extent, but if you take this deep view in world literature, you actually see that it's just a return to an older form of literary production. And I think it's become clear that this is where the action lies and this is what has to happen. So we started a very small initiative that's just starting with Yasa and Gloria Benedict. We're basically trying to utilize some of the uh, points I just made and where we encourage, in a sense, that where we're trying to compile, um, encourage the production, oh, I don't know what that is, uh, the production of stories. But this is, this is an attempt to, to actually say we need these science-based stories they have to be collectively authored. We are trying to do that uh, in, this, in this initiative. And so this brings me to the end. And maybe now I can't. Uh, hmm. <laughs> it's, it's fine. It's fine. There's no, there's no problem here. Um, let me wrap up this way. And then me with the way I began. Um, um, a week ago with this quotation, the birth of the idea of world literature from Goethe, where Goethe says national literatures don't mean much anymore. The era of world literature has begun and we have to strive to hasten its approach. And I think these words are really true today as well, but in a slightly different way. I think we are, we ha are entering a new era of world literature. Whereas Goethe's era was determined by the printing press, by European colonialism, among other things, our era of world literature is determined by um, new media technologies, our phase, accelerated phase of globalization. Um, but I think that, and so we have to embrace that. I think we have to understand this era of world literature as an era uh, of world literature, and as Goethe reprimands Ackermann, his interlocutor, I think we even have to strive to hasten its approach. Why? I think because we need world literature. We need world literature for all the reasons why we need literature, uh, but we also need world literature, and we need to understand this new phase of world literature in order to help solve some of our great problems, including climate change. So this is the idea of these lectures, world literature for a changing planet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who would have thought that a few days ago we were looking back and now we find ourselves called to look future, um, look forward. I'm sure there are questions and comments already from the audience, and if there are, can you just wait until the microphone? No, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter, for this. I mean, it is, I mean, it is in a way, the great contribution of modernism, let's say, just put it that way, to, to think about, to interrupt certain kinds of stories, to, 
to, to think about, to, to do precisely what you so eloquently uh, described. And yes, I think it is important to remember that um, because stories are powerful tools and like any tool, they can be used for very different purposes, uh, including purposes that we don't want to use them for. And so I think that a lot of modernists recognize that and wanted to interrupt this machinery in a way uh, to free up spaces, as you say. Um, and, and I understand that, and I think I, I do want to take that on board. However, I think that this, what I would consider modernist ethos, this anti-storytelling ethos, uh, which is in the domain of theater, I've thought a lot and wrote a lot about anti-theatricality in a sort of parallel conversation. What, what, what I would say, however, is that I think this modernist ethos plays a large role in our critical practices. And it sometimes seems to me that we have forgotten to use stories as tools for our own purposes. So um, I, I think we should, we should be more confident in using them, and, but using them well, using them while taking on board these cautionary tales that, that you rightly point out and that I think especially the modernists uh, uh, have come up with. Also taking them on board in order to do the kind of critical reading that I proposed, for example, for the Epic of Gilgamesh. You could say this is a perfect example of what Virginia Woolf is talking about. Here, literature celebrates resource extraction. We, we have to get away from that, so we have to get away from these kinds of stories. But I think in the end, um, you don't get there just by interrupting certain kinds of stories. I think you have to replace them with other stories. And so this is why I would say let's not throw out the, you know, the, the how, how would I put this, the baby of storytelling with the bathwater of bad stories or something like that. No. Yeah, I, I have a solution to that. Just, just kidding. No, it's, it's, uh, it, now, I mean, you're putting it really well, and I, but I, I would say this is precisely what literature perhaps can do, at least to some extent. I mean, I think this is what Marx and Engels tried to do with the Communist Manifesto, to turn bodies, exploited bodies, and physical bodies, into an agent, and you, you use the term virtual, maybe that, that's one way, but, or, or it, it, you know, it's not just about bodies. It has to be, to turn bodies into an agent, you need something else. And, and they realized, it's fascinating how they sort of invent the genre of the manifesto in grappling with this problem. They first think that they want to write it as a form of catechism, sort of questions and answers where you, can, where you come up with the right answers, uh, you know, theoretical principles, but then they realize, no, 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 this is, this is not about a catechism. This is not about a body of theory. This is actually a text that has to manifest something that doesn't exist before, maybe in, in virtual. So I think that, that this, is what, this is what you need stories for, in particular, not just stories, any, and not just any old story, but also we have to think about the uh, genres. We have to maybe, more, we can't just use the Communist Manifesto as a model uh, for, for perhaps reasons that I've described, but to, to mold genres that somehow are up to this task and that I think deal with this queasiness around the we, um, that, that's the hope, that's the proposition. That's as far as I got. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Maybe have to invite you back when, when you've got the, yeah, exactly. not the answer. I'll report the proposition. Back. Yeah. Thank you. So the uh, next question I think was, was I'm forgetting quickly. Um,
Yeah, no, thank, thank you very much, Kristen. Uh, so I think that, the, you know, the, the in selecting an individual for the, you know, kind of parse per toto uh, uh, is, uh, is a wonderful, I would say, technique of representation, right? To, 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 to take this impossible to represent and think and imagine scale and, and turn it into something that you can represent, reprehend apprehend and, and relate to, uh, and then somehow the, you know, there are various ways of doing this to frame it in such that you then get back into the, the bigger domain, the, you know, the small scale and the large scale. I think that is not, so that's, I would say that this is a technique of representation, sort of the, uh, I suppose that's where I started today, of, it's a, te a technique of making something visible um, not sure that it is a um, model for a protagonist, right? Because it seems to me that's more a, um, a technique of representation rather than of action, I guess. Is, but maybe you would disagree. But that's the, the distinction I would propose. So this is where the Communist Manifesto and its attempt not just to represent something, but to 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 create an agent uh, is the, the other model, though with its own problems, that, that I find interesting. And that's different just from the kind of parse per toto um, representation. So I had Laura and another question here at the front. Yes. Um, I, I have to admit that I haven't thought very much about that. So I think that, but it's, it's good that you remind me to perhaps do that. I mean, Freud, fantastic storyteller. Among, I mean, perhaps sometimes too, too good a storyteller to go back to Peter's point in his case studies where he gets so caught up in his own story of, of Dora and others that he is actually blinded. By, by his sort of detective piece, putting all the pieces together. Uh, anyway, um, but psychoanalysis, uh, so what, what, may I just throw this back? I think, do you have a more? Uh, So absolutely. So I think that's, um, thank you, that's very helpful, that clarifies. Yes, I think the, the, the lexicon of affects is, is really cru crucial and for me, as you say, it, it was a little bit part of our, these discussions about story types and what kind of affective responses, I suppose a kind of reader response criticism, uh, uh, but a more, of a more empirical uh, nature. Uh, can do. There, there, there are a few. There's, there's one s scholar whose name escapes me right now, a younger scholar who works at Yale Singapore, who basically is, is not working with psychoanalysis, but with affective responses, and who says, who has said, I think rightly so, we actually have, yes, we have great theories of reader response criticism, mm -hmm. um, but we actually have very little empirical data on it. So he found a way of using Amazon um, and he started to do some empirical studies of reader response. People who read environment, different kinds of environmental literature and how they actually respond to it would be very interesting to find out. So this is, uh, you know, this is not so much a kind of rereading of Freud, but I think taking on board some of what you're calling for, namely to say that this is a supercharged emotional domain with all the problems, but also maybe opportunities that go along with that. And that, and that um, 
especially when we're talking about narrativizing some of this, uh, uh, we, we need to reckon with it and maybe not just reckon and understand it, but actually maybe even use it or at least understand it. Yeah, so no, I think that's, uh, thank you very much. And so thanks for clarifying. So this, this one young scholar I think has done really interesting or starting to do really interesting work uh, along those lines. Mm -hmm. Can I just pick up on a couple of Laura's words here? Because there was loss, uh, melancholy this morning, this trauma, and there seemed to be a strain in what you were talking about, which was a kind of romanticism. It was interesting that you glossed it in passing, and that the scholar you cited had said that the eco-criticism had sat in national traditions, and it made me yes. think that. I, I wonder where the space is in this um, for a kind of utopics and a, yeah. and a, and a Promethean yes. strain, which has its problems in the yes. environmental context. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking, I can see my colleague Julie in the, course, uh, in, in the audience, the literature I work on has a whole strain of, of that, yes. and the word we is heavily yes. complicated yes. and yes. contested. Yes. And I, I just wonder that the other yeah. the right. other great debate we're having at the moment is what new technologies and AI do right. to our world. So we, we're in a, an interesting interplay between yes. a, a global right. eco uh, yes. ecological crisis, but also a technological one. Right. How, okay. how do you marry these, not in terms of solutions, right. in terms of narratives and, 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 and how one tells stories. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I think I can, I, I think you, in a sense, answered uh, uh, your question. A, or a bad question, apology. No, no, not at all, not at all. No, I think I, I, I completely agree with this. And, you know, utopianism and you know, all of this, uh, you know, right, in the history of Russian literature is such a great example of that. So I think that's right. I think, I mean, I think everything needs to be on the table and we need to find ways of using these things. So I, I, I agree. Yeah, no, so th thank you for this point. And yeah, so I, so I, yes, I do think they are harmed by it. Uh, but at the same time, I'm telling myself, you know, it's, it, the so solution can't be to, to say to these movements, yeah, write your manifesto. I mean, I, I sometimes have this impulse. I, I, I'm sort of on the margins of some of the people involved with, some of my students were involved with Occupy Wall Street at once offered my services as a manifesto consultant to them. <laughs> they, they, they didn't take me up on, 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 on this generous offer. Uh, uh, so I think that, so, you know, it became clear to me, it should have been clear anyway, that, that that's probably not the way to go, but there's some, something, some, I think, literary form, some form of collective imagining in some kind of genre, I think has to happen to make it sustainable. I don't, if I you know, knew the answer, uh, I would give it to you. So I don't know. But I, 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 I think I see, I, I believe I see a problem uh, uh, that, that needs to be solved. That's, that's as far as I've got. And I think you, uh, in a sense, restated the problem uh, really well. So I, I couldn't agree with you. And, and I think that we all have to try to solve it somehow. So I've logged two more questions here. There's one in the middle and then one at the very back there. So I wonder if you could take, oh, and a, a third has just popped up. That's is even better. Thank you very much for this thought. So I think that the, the thought behind these invoking the frame tales, I think is meant to, in a sense, 
respond to something that you just now uh, uh, elaborated so fully, namely that there shouldn't be one story with the Joseph Campbell because if we have one story, there's always a lot of, a lot of things get written out. So it has to be more a kind of, you know, as I put it, collecting and aggregating different specific stories from very different points of view, very much taking on board, I mean, what was behind, what's behind this thinking is very much feminist, post-colonial, many other forms of critique that, that caution against you know, coming up with one grand narrative. So, so I would say that, that I, I, I would fully agree with you and, and think that, um, that this idea of collecting, aggregating, you know, thinking about different individual authors collectively, different stories emerging from that, I think that's the image we, we have uh, in order to precisely to deal with this uh, 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 Joseph Campbell problem, uh, uh, so that we don't come up with a sort of one hero. The, the hero itself is, 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 is a big problem here that needs to be questioned. So I think what you say about Kareth is very interesting, uh, uh, and I'll think more about it. But I, I think that the, the, the way we arrived at this sort of more collective model was precisely through a, a, a thought process uh, and an argument like the one you, you made. And, and actually in the performance, which is quite long, there, there, are, there are great moments of vulnerability. I mean, I think that's sort of at the, actually at the heart of this, um, this idea of reciprocity, that there is vulnerability in need everywhere. Uh, and that, um, in fact, as social beings, we constantly are, in, I mean, this is sort of this, uh, this, this new evolutionary model this biologist has come up is that there are all these complicated networks of help and or care, uh, as you put it, that 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 are part of this reciprocity, especially indirect reciprocity. That's not a kind of direct, you know, quid pro quo or or something like that. So I think that 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 was. In, I take your point about the 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 the, dan the professional dancing bodies, um, but I think that they did attempt precisely to capture something about vulnerability and care and reciprocity that's built into that uh, different kind of model. Yeah. And there's one at the back, oh, in fact two questions up at the back and then I think we'll uh, not draw a line under things but pause for the moment. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I, I think it's, it's a, thank you, uh, Ralph, for this question. And I mean, it, I think it's at, very much been at the center of, a, of, of the kind of, if you will, classical canon of environmental literature, right? Including this kind of non-human, uh, uh, grappling with the non-human that, that I mentioned in passing, in part because I feel like that's, uh, it's not because I care less about it, but I feel like that's where the current uh, state of eco-criticism is, is very good at, and it's a very elaborate discourse. So I, I, um, I, 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 I'm, I, I totally agree that that's, and that's one of the, uh, clearly that's one of the things that nature writing, um, both the, the, uh, you know, literary criticism that looks at different forms of nature writing, for example, looking at Thoreau and thinking about Thoreau's position as a you know white settler colonialist uh, who who finds himself in this part of the world, uh, what gets erased, what stories is not being told by Thoreau, for example. I mean, this th this is where the energy of eco criticism has been, as well as thinking about uh, uh, yeah, different relationships to to animals, to the to the natural world. So absolutely, I think that's in a, some sense that's I suppose dealt with it much too briefly 
under the rubric of representation, but it's probably more than representation. I think it also goes back to, Laura, your point about affect and, and, and how we, I mean, Melanie Klein and the thing, uh, 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 the object, uh, uh, all, I think all plays a role. So I think that that is one of the powers of literature to do that. Um, and that um, I think that continues to, 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 to be a, a powerful source. I feel like this is something, as I said, what, what, what a lot of the classical texts of environmental writing has been already working towards, I think, in, in, in different ways. So, uh, which is maybe why I dealt with it less, because I felt like I had much, I didn't have anything new to contribute to it. But I think you're absolutely right, and thank you for reminding us of, of that. Um, I, you know, I think, I, think, I think this is a great argument that, that they definitely should play a role, and I agree about the, 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 the level. It's partially prejudice, some, you know, but it's also true people who get into this field feel very strongly, and, and they, 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 they're not often the suave ironists. Uh, um, um, so I think, I think you're right, and I, think, I don't think that the frame tale necessarily has to be ironic in its relation to the material, but it certainly can. There's a lot of room, that's the beauty of, 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 a, of the frame tale, that it can sort of mobilize and relate to the, to the multiplicity that is collected within. And also these frames, that's the other thing I love about them, that they, they are, they're very porous. And, and they are more, they're, it's not so much that they're sort of create neat packages, because these, what I love about these frame tales, and this maybe relates to the earlier question also, um, are texts move in and out of them constantly. I mean, the history of the th Thousand and One Nights is a perfect example, uh, uh, that new stories get, get added, stories get compiled combined stories move from one collection to the other. So they're, 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 they're ways of, uh, uh, in a way, the, the image I have is that there, there's this ocean of stories, that's the name of another sort of meta frame tale narrative from, from South Asia. It's a frame tale narrative of, of frame tale narratives. I mean, you can keep building these frames, levels of irony, perfect example of that. But that they, 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 they combine, they use, they select, they serve as filters, <coughs> they, in some sense, can instrumentalize in a kind of weak way. Um, but, but this happens over and over again. There isn't sort of just this, this one frame. So that there's, a lot, there, there's a lot of dynamic, I, I see a lot of dynamic, exciting things happening around frame tale narratives and how the individual frames and stories within stories can, can relate. And I think your, your argument about uh, wit and irony and, and all of that, I think it's a great, I think it's a great, suggestion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, talking of tales, Martin has been promised a trip to the Eagle and Child, which is a great Oxford storytelling centre, and so I hope you'll forgive me if I wrap things up at this point. I also hesitate to offer a collective summary of how grateful we are, and everything I say, if I say the word we, it is nearly an <laughs> extrapolation of I, but that's what being a director allows you to do very periodically, so let me do that. Thank you, Martin, for enlightening us, for delighting us, for occasionally provoking us. I'm very pleased that watchwords of cooperation and reciprocity will remain with us in all that we do. When we first started talking with Princeton about a series on European history and culture, I was very keen that those words should never be seen as constraining or something to take uncritically and to simply celebrate. So I'm very glad in our inaugural series that that European frame has been comprehensively exploded and we'll see where the pieces fall. Thank you too for giving us a masterclass in storytelling, in narration, in teaching us how to tell stories to each other, which help us define, refine and question who we might be collectively and individually.
Thank you to members of the audience for being part of this cooperative reciprocal process. It's terrific and inspiring to see an audience made up of undergraduates, graduates, faculty members, visitors to Oxford, and Oxford's intellectually voracious and curious public. Thank you for making this possible. It would have been a wonderful lecture series had I just been sitting here on my own listening to Martin. I think I can say confidently from this end of things that it's been even more exciting to have lots of you in the room for this. There will be a podcast of the three lectures, and so thank you very much for the team who've been yeah. able to yeah. film and who will turn it into this lasting legacy. There will also, no pressure here, Martin, be a book. And uh, when that is out, I'm sure we'll want to return to some of these ideas in some form or other. This is not the end of the conversation, but really a staging post in what has been a very exciting few days for us. Thank you, above all, Martin, for coming to Oxford and sharing these lectures with us. Thank you.